the Tangut word for five, which is the topic of my talk today. Um, Nathan started today's um, event by talking about the problem of Tangut transcription. And I have a system that I use, which is probably unfamiliar to almost all of you, or all of you. So I should probably explain how it works here. Um, it incorporates some aspects that are influenced by the system of Professor Al Power here. Um, one of those aspects is that I, oops, I mark congruent tones using numerals in the beginning of the syllable. So the first number in the target forms in this presentation are tones. And there are two possible tones, one and two, which are conventionally called level and rising, even which are the target names for the tones, but whether those are the actual forms of the tones is uncertain as these names are have become highly conventionalized in the Chinese tradition. The, oops, the middle of the syllable in my system is fairly self-explanatory. It's the consonants and vowels of the syllable. The one exception is that I use the letter Y to represent some sort of vowel like uh or u. Uh. It's a deliberately non-committal symbol. My transcription is not intended as phonetic notation. It's somewhat abstract. So I use numbers for the tones because I, I am non-committal about how tones sounded. And I want to use Y because all I know about Y for sure is, is that it's some sort of central vowel. It's not E, it's not A, it's not A, it's not O, it's not O, but exactly what it was, I don't know. The last number, oops, last number in my system at the very end of the syllable is the grade of the, of the syllable. Um, Shun Gong just talked at great length about grade two, and um, in my system I have four grades rather than three. But, um, these represent what I used to think, why with the different grades were, I don't actually believe this anymore. But these are some ideas I used to have for a number of years. You can think of the grades as flavors of the rhymes. So a grade one, two, three, or four, why, is they have some kind of common quality, obviously, but they sound slightly different. And exactly how they sound different is something I'm non-committal about. I mean, here I threw in some old suggestions of mine that I don't even believe anymore. So I prefer to just use the abstract numerals instead to speak of a grade one Y or a grade two Y rather than commit to saying that this rhyme is uvularized or whatever. Although I am now strongly tempted to, to adopt Shun Kong's system. Um, I, I, for, the, for this presentation, I will be not commit. Now, when I first started learning Tangu over 20 years ago, one of the first things I did was learn the numerals for 1 through 10. And I was kind of amused when Professor Alcala began his uh, talk on Tonga last week with these very numerals. <laughs> and it's, and um, so these are the very first 10 characters I learned how to write and the first 10 words I learned. And these are their readings in oops, my system. Um, and one thing I noticed immediately was that some of the numerals are very obviously resemble the written Tibetan numerals, which I've marked. So I've marked the similar pairs in green here. Um, one, of the, one pair that has bothered me for over 20 years, and which is the talk, subject of today's talk, is the number five. 
Here you can see in two and three and nine, there's a pretty close resemblance, sort of obvious resemblance. With five, there's something strange going on. It, there's a W in the Tongue that corresponds to nothing in Tibetan. And these other cases, they have similar vowels like U and E, kind of close, O and U, kind of close, U and U, kind of close, but U and A are kind of different. And then there's this strange W. So this has bothered me for over 20 years. Now, I showed that there were only a few pairs that were really obvious cognates, but if you trace back the history of the Tibetan numerals, which um, I did with Nathan's help, and, um, and, if, and tracing back the earlier forms of the Tonkut numerals using a system that I published five years ago, you can see that most of these, except for seven and 10, which are completely hopeless and unrelated, most of these are actually the cognates. And the resemblances are pretty good in most cases, except five is still a problem. Even if you go back in time, you still end up with diff very different vowels, an E and an A. Ah. And how can this be reconciled? Assuming this, these are really cognates, and I'm pretty sure they are. Why does the tongue at five end in ah? And why, oh, and why does it have a medial w? Using my, sis, using my system, if I take this back in time, I end up with the me or the e. But throughout Sino Tibetan, the word for five in the oldest languages universally has ah, Old Chinese, Tibetan, Burmese, and the language I've been working on for the last couple of years, Pew, which is an extinct uh, Sino Tibetan language that was once spoken in Burma. So we have all these votes for ah, and Tongue has an E here. What's going on? Why is Tongue the odd man out? Let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that all these other languages are conservative in their numerals for five, and that Tongan at one point used to have ah. Let's just pretend this is the case. And interestingly, this, recon this reconstruction, which is what I proposed about five years ago, looks like pew, which I never saw until two years ago. <laughs> so that makes me kind of feel good. So let's just adopt this hypothesis for the time being that that Tongue used to have ha, ah, but somehow it changed to this. But why and how? How can we bridge the gap between this w or whatever it was and ah? The short answer is you can't do it. It's not possible. Tangut wa normally should come from pre tangut u or ut, but not a as Guillaume Jacques demonstrated in his book. So, what is going on here? I mean, do we, should, should I just give up on five and just say that, oh, they, that, um, you know, it kind of looks like the other words, it, ha it has a ng like the other words, but the vowels just simply make no sense at all, so it's just a complete coincidence that. That, that Tonkin has this no word, which is totally unrelated to all these other words. Should we do that? I don't, let's see if we have to. Guillaume Jacques' solution to the five problem was to, was to reconstruct five in Tonkin as had an U, which is okay according to his rules, in which W comes from U or Ut. And Japug, a language that Shingong has referred to, which is a relative of Tangut, in, um, has an U in its word for five. So this is not, this is, this is kind of plausible. But we still have another problem. Okay, so Japug and P 
keep and Jaco and Kang would agree, but they still don't agree with all these other languages. What's going on? Now, I will present a very different solution to the problem of five. Um, Gong Huang Cheng pointed out that Tanglet has a number of pairs of words in which one word has no medial W, so this ties into our first talk today, and the second word, which has a similar meaning, or like, for example, in this case, red, and to turn red, to, to blush or something, has a W in it. So Gong found a number of these pairs. In 2012, I published a paper in which I theorized that these medial Ws were from earlier P prefixes. So, so this turn red is from the root for red plus a prefix P. P ne becomes nue. The P weakens to a wa and kind of switches places. So, maybe the medial W in 5, which is weird, is also from some kind of P prefix. So just as pne becomes nue, pna becomes mu. Well, the vowel is still weird, but this could explain the W. And as we've seen, we've seen before, P does have a P syllable before the na. So this p corresponds to the p that I propose here for Tongrit. And I proposed this thing for Tongrit years before I ever looked at pew at all. So this is not some kind of circular thing. So I think that's how the w originated. But we're still stuck with the problem of, of why, sorry, I was circling the wrong word. I mean that. Of why 5 has u. Uh, for the vowel. It shouldn't. Um, I'll skip this part. Um, once again, e uh, cannot be derived from a. Ah. Guillaume Jacques' book on Tonga demonstrates that e uh, can have a whole bunch of different sources. E, it, it, Oop and ot, but not ah. So we still have a problem here. This is impossible. You, how can how can my claim that five be related to all those other ah words work if if, if five has uh? It's not possible. Um. You may have noticed that in the program there is an extremely generic title for this talk. That's because I, I, I've been working on Pew for the last couple of years, and um, when it came time to write up something for SOAS, um, I was asked what I want, Nathan asked me what I wanted to do, and I said, I don't know, so he just made up some <laughs> generic filler. And as, as the talk approached, he and I were on a bus in Burma working on our Pew project. And I still had no idea what to do. And for some reason, I was babbling about Tongwood because Pew is my day job currently. And Tongwood is what I do as a hobby. And I, I, I was saying something about Tongwood. And, and um, Nathan can correct me if I'm remembering wrong, but at some point, the numerals came up for some reason. Maybe because of that, the Pew numeral for five, which was, has been very much in my mind. And I pointed out the odd. Uh, vowels in the pew numerals, and Nathan suggested that maybe the, numeral, the vowel for five was influenced by the vowel for four. And um, that is his contribution to this, because everything else after this is all my fault. So don't blame him for anything after this. But I thought, yeah, this is, that, 
there might be something to it because look, they both have uhs. But on the other hand, there are some problems. Um, they have different grades, for one thing. And four also has a retroflex uh. It, so this is something like er or something. And there is a marker here for a mysterious vowel quality that I have yet to identify. So yes, they both, they're both romanized in my system with Y's, but they're not really the same rhyme. This is uh, and this is er, or something like that. So now, I've changed, now I'm facing a different problem. How, I'm going, how do I re reconcile these two rhymes, and why would this even happen in the first, why would you get the vowel like that from in the first place? Well, it, well, let's just see if I can try to make this work. So once again, let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that the pure word for five, oh no, excuse me, the tongue good word for five is like all the other early signs of death words and has an ah. If we trace back the word for four, the e uh goes back to an e. So in the earliest stage, they have completely different vowels. There's just nothing in common with these two at all. Now, in tongue good, there is a chain shift in which e becomes e. Uh. So the, the e of four became, became e. Uh. And then the original a uh becomes the new e. So tonga became, so rol d became rol d. And tonga became tangi. So in stage two, the vowels have changed, but they're still distinct from each other. On the other hand, I should note that a and u are kind of diff are very different, but e and u are becoming phonetically more similar. They're, they're still distinct, but they're not as distinct as, as high u and low a. In stage three, five and four are adjacent numerals. And Nathan's suggestion was that the vowel of four kind of, you know, kind of rubbed off on the vowel for five. So at this stage, they have, now they have the same vowel, and the E has been replaced by a U, which is a different vowel, but kind of similar. So now, now these two words rhyme. There are precedents for this sort of thing. cases of what I call adjacent numeral influence. For instance, in English, um, four and five have the same initial consonant. But in Proto-European, the two words had very different initial consonants, qua and pa. Theoretically, what to war should have become English war, which is kind of disturbing. Um, but we are, in fact have four. The initial five has spread to four. This is a case of initials, though. The, to the tongue case involves rhymes. So do you have any cases of the ends of numerals becoming, of adjacent numerals becoming similar? Yes, we do. In Proto-Indo-European, nine and 10 had different final consonants. And to this day, English nine still has the final end. And in Latin, on the other hand, we have novem and decem, as in November and December, in which the M ending of 10 has spread to nine. <coughs> Theoretically, the Latin numeral for nine should be novem with the N from Proto-Indo-European, but it's not. So let's go back to Tonga with one warning, which is that I'm going to mention a series of changes, and the order of those changes is uncertain. The order that I present here is 
arbitrary because I have to present them in some I have to present them in some sort of chronological order. Um, I can't just dump them all in front of you and say apply them all at the same time. It's not going to work. But I really don't know the order of these things at all. So um, this is my old my old hypothesis about the grades, which I presented in Hamburg, and which I am pretty skeptical about now, is that the grades were partly conditioned by earlier lost vowels. I won't go into huge detail on this. I'll just state here that in, in this old theory of mine, which is in my 2012 paper, low vowels conditioned the lower number grades, and high vowels conditioned the higher number grades. So this, this syllable has no low vowels in it whatsoever, so it gets a high number grade. This syllable has a low vowel, uh, so it develops a low grade. So at this stage then, the, the rhymes start to diverge. Earlier, these two words would have rhymed in my hypothetical snap. But once the grades start to develop, they Diverge. I mean, they're still they're still similar vowels, which is why you still use the same symbol Y for them. But now they belong to different grades and have different flavors of some sort. The the low vowel that conditioned grade one disappears completely. So now you can no longer predict the grades at all. They've become completely phonemic. In the next stage. Oops. I've already mentioned how, P, how I think medio W develops from a uh, prefix P. So the prefix P of 5 becomes W, and the earlier prefix R of 4 conditions a retroflex vowel. So this is L -der. So now the rhymes are very, very different. This is a grade 1 Y, and this is a grade 4 R. Then they diverge even further. I have proposed a mystery suffix in Tangut that I call X. And this suffix accounts for word, word families that Gong Huang Chung discovered and that he thought involved short and long vowels. So one of his word families was wind with, in Gong's reconstruction, a short vowel, uh, and blow, so a verb based on wind, with a long vowel, uh. In my system, I don't have vowel length. And I propose that Gong's so-called long vowel derivatives have this mystery suffix x. It's a mysterious suffix because I cannot figure out what its phonetic value was using the aforementioned Tibetan, Chinese, or Sanskrit materials. It doesn't seem to correspond to anything. Um, all I can say is, is that syllables with this mysterious x quality tend not to be used to write Sanskrit. So whatever it was must have sounded very un-Sanskrit. In my target notation, I use x to indicate the mysterious, oh, excuse me, the mysterious source of this distinction, and I use an apostrophe to to indicate it in my tongue transcription. So this is the source, and this is the outcome. Phonetically, what these things were, I have absolutely no idea. I call this apostrophe symbol prime, even though it's not really a mathematical prime symbol, but it's a lot easier to type. And um, so there it is in four. So once this affix was added to four, I don't know what it was doing there, really. Um, it made the, the rhymes extremely different. So now we have grade one Y on one hand, and grade four Y with retroflexion and the mystery quality. 
I've added the tone numbers here because in my version of Tongue language history, Tongue tones develop depending on the presence or absence of a final H. And since none of, neither of these words have a final H, they develop tone one by default. So, in my proposed solution, I include a number of changes that give you some idea of how my larger Tongut reconstruction system works. So this is a review of what we've seen so far. There's a change shift from E to the first, and then A to E. So it's as if when E goes to E, this leaves a blank because there's no more E that's filled by the A. The vowel of four spread to five. I don't really care for this grades for this version of the grades anymore, but it's in the PowerPoint, so we're kind of stuck with it for the next few minutes. Um, so in my old system, low vowels condition low number grades, and high vowels condition high number high number grades, with variation depending on the initial. These grade conditioning vowels in some cases disappeared. A prefix P is a source of medial W that is found in some word families and in five. A prefix R conditions vowel retroflexion that I write as a suffix R, but it's not a real R, it's just a quality of the vowel. There's a process of adding some kind of mysterious affix that I write as X, and that this X in turn in my transcription is written as a pseudo prime symbol. And finally, um, I propose that tongue tones reflect the presence or absence of final laryngeals, as in Chinese, and that if we go back to the number 10, we can see one example of a final H conditioning tone two. All these other ones have tone one because they don't have any final origin. They don't have any final origins in my system. So my hope here is, is that not only have I more or less solved the problem of why five is a really strange rhyme. I say more or less because now that I don't like this great system here, this has to be somewhat revised, but I think much of this presentation is still salvageable. Um, but beyond that very, very specific problem, I, I, I thought it might be interesting to give a demonstration of some of the changes and rules in my view of the history of Tonga, using five as an ex five and four as examples. And with that summary, I have come now to the joie or the end. <laughs>